<laughs> Welcome, John Spiro. Welcome, everybody. We will. Um, we might start with our second session. Um, and this panel session is looking at the role of repair in product stewardship and the circular economy. And I'll hand it over to John Gatsakis from eWaste Watch, who's going to chair this. But I'd like to welcome um, Spiro Kalos from the Australian Mobile Telecommunications Association and Mobile Muster, um, Janet Leslie, who's on my left, Australian Information Industry Association, and Ian McAllister from the Consumer Electronics Suppliers Association. So over to you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Leanne, and, and well done to you and Griffith and all of the participants in, uh, in running this event today. It's a great opportunity <coughs> to kick off a broader discussion around the role of repair and durability and where, where it relates to the Australian context is really, really important. So big thanks uh, to everyone for being part of this. We've got three key associations uh, here with us and very grateful to the AAA, to CESA and AMTA for, for joining us. Um, it really is uh, important that we have industry participating in these sorts of uh, discussions. And so thanks again to Janet, Spiro and to Ian. As many of you will know, prolonging the life uh, value and functionality of products and components and materials is a key circular economy principle. So what's the relevance of increased repairability for industry product stewardship schemes where manufacturers and brands are taking greater responsibility for their products cradle to cradle? To what extent is repairability an important element of product stewardship schemes moving forward? And what are some of the barriers and what are some of the opportunities? Uh, our panellists will share their views uh, and insights on some of these questions in the time that we have. But if we're, uh, if we're serious about waste avoidance and waste reduction in Australia and the practical implementation of circular economy principles, we do need to move up the waste management hierarchy faster and we need to do it with genuine conviction. And that's very, very important. Um, the time is right to repair, but it does require policies and programs that acknowledge the barriers and the opportunities to making it work as a waste avoidance and reduction strategy. And we mustn't overlook the social and the cultural dimension when we're talking about repair. Repair is just as much about empowering consumers to take control of the products they purchase and own. And it is as it is about waste reduction. And we've heard various uh, commentary and discussion from other panellists and speakers today about the role of the consumer and the, what the market is saying in parts that they want. In Australia, we have the National Waste Policy Action Plan. Um, if that plan uh, is serious about waste uh, avoidance and reduction, then product durability, repairability, reusability and improved recycling and recyclability is really, really important, especially as it relates to meeting growing consumer expectations about the goods that we use every day in all spheres of life. So let me introduce our panellists in a little bit more detail. Um, it's important as part of setting that context. Janet Leslie is the chair of the CSR Policy Advisory Network with the Australian Information Industry Association. Janet's also the sustainability manager for Canon Oceania. Canon, of many of the brands that I've come across over the years uh, in Australia, has a long history of taking a full life cycle approach to product design. And Janet's been very active for over a decade in various programs, cartridges for Planet Arc, the NTCRS, uh, the Australian Battery Recycling Initiative, um, and, and is here today as chair of the Australian Information Industry CSR's Policy Advisory Network. Janet's also a director of the Australia and New Zealand Recycling Platform and one of the leading not-for-profit industry-run co-regulatory arrangements under the National Television and Computer Recycling Scheme, a strong advocate for national multi-stakeholder product stewardship schemes. I'll quickly introduce Spiro and Ian as well so we can get, get those... Uh, done and you can know who's who's talking to you today. Um, but Spiro Kalos is the head of product stewardship for the Australian uh, Telecommunications uh, Mobile Telecommunications Association, and he also manages the Mobile Muster program. Uh, over two decades of experience with the telco industry, Spiro is one of Australia's experts in e-waste and mobile phone recycling. 
As a head of product stewardship for AMTA, Spiro manages the government accredited stewardship program, Mobile Muster, which is funded voluntarily by the major handset manufacturers and the network providers, the telcos. Mobile Muster um, is very active committed to raising awareness and educating the community on how and why we should all be recycling more, along with tackling the barriers to reuse and repair. Ian McAllister, the CEO of the Consumer Electronic Suppliers Association, and uh, Ian has also been very active in the industry, in the sector for many years. Uh, he is the uh, CEO of Caesar and also the director of Strathaird Link Consulting. Ian's got over 30 years experience in ICT industry policy development, government relations, regulatory policy formulation in Australia and in the APEC region. And like Janet, um, had deep involvement in the development of the Product Stewardship Act, the NTCRS and the continuing body of work um, that's been going on in the uh, electrical electronics equipment space in Australia. But now, if we could really hand over, if I can hand over to uh, Janet first to give us um, a snapshot, some insights of what's happening in her industry uh, and around IT and uh, how it relates to repair in product stewardship. Over to you, Janet. Okay, thanks, John. Um, so, as John said, I'm here, I'm from Canon, but I'm, I'm the chair of our um, AIIA CSR Policy Advisory Network, and that's most of the major hardware and software brands um, in the IT sector, so Canon, Dell, HP, IBM, Brother, Cisco, Microsoft. Um, so I really related to what Stuart said about giving 10 years of his life to get the uh, motor vehicle scheme up and running. Um, both Ian and I and John gave at least 10 years to getting the national TV and computer and recycling scheme up and running. and. Um, as John said, it's still an ongoing, ongoing piece of work there. So although we're fierce competitors when it comes to selling our products, um, on a lot of um, environmental issues, we think it makes sense to collaborate. Um, and it's better for our customers and better for us uh, and for the community as well. And so that's why we do have all these um, product stewardship schemes that we support. Uh, for those who don't know about the national TV and computer recycling scheme, um, all of the people who import TVs and computers into Australia, including printers, um, are required to collect and recycle those products according to um, national standards, uh, <coughs> protecting health and safety environmental standards. Um, and generally speaking, that scheme's been pretty successful. So I thought I'd just mention, before I talk about the Productivity Commission report and the recommendations about product stewardship, I thought I'd just mention some of the things that our OEMs have in place already. So in terms of product design, which is obviously where it all starts, we all have and write quite a lot of information about um, our rigorous programs to design products that are um, not only more useful for our customers, but also um, to reduce the environmental impact at every stage of their life cycle. So we're making smaller, lighter products with fewer resources, more renewable resources, more durable. And just from our own uh, industry, for example, in printers, and we've heard some um, remarks about cartridges and what have you this today. Mm -hmm. um, but so in our industry now, we're moving to uh, mega tank printers. So they're printers with large refillable um, ink tanks, long lasting, and we have long, long guarantee, uh, warranties on our cameras. All of the um, OEMs have repair and reuse programs in place. So a lot of our products are actually leased and then brought back to us. And most of us, some companies repair parts and products in Australia, um, but a lot of us have international hubs where we send products for repair and reuse and then for selling into different markets. So um, there's a fair amount of repair and reuse going on already um, through, through those sort of programs. Um, most of us sell second-hand products as well, refurbished products. And, um, and in Canon's case, just addressing the point that Erin made about printers, we've tried to um, address some of the issues that people have with printers by having um, a hotline, 24-hour hotline that will 
really help people get get things to work properly. Um, so, so I guess I just wanted to say that because there are a lot of initiatives that are already happening and that people perhaps don't know about. But in terms of responding to the Productivity Commission report, um, first of all, we welcome the finding that there's little evidence of um, OEMs deliberately designing for obsolescence. That's certainly our experience. Um, our, our equipment's becoming more and more reliable all the time. Um, we, we also welcome the proposal uh, for the ACCC to provide advice on warranty periods. It's always a really tricky thing for us to sort of uh, compare our expectations and consumers' expectations with how long a product will last, how long you need to keep parts, how to update software programs when operating systems are changing. So, so I think to have a general consensus on some of those things would be really helpful. Um, we, we, uh, in the National TV and Computer Scheme, um, we're, we're a bit uncertain about the proposal to include repair targets in the NTCRS. Um, and I think, well, we certainly want to be involved in the discussion because when we designed that scheme, it was very much designed as an end-of-life scheme. And the idea was that repair would be encouraged and that products would be funnelled into the repair options before they came back for end-of-life recycling. So it was never designed to be anti-repair or anything like that. And we, we're just not sure how you would change the scheme to include um, uh, repaired products within the targets. Um, but we, we do have... Um, and, and our past experience is that the products that come back through the NTCRS are generally speaking really old and not really fit for reuse. We're actually doing, one of our members is doing a survey on that right at the moment. Um, we think there's a need for further work to understand the repair industry and the asset management industry in our sector. There's not a lot of data available because um, the targets at the moment only relate to the regulated part of the industry. So there's a whole market out there that's not regulated, that's not really covered. Um, we did have one idea about the targets, and that is that because it's a mature scheme now, you know, we've got a target of 80% of whatever we sell essentially has to get recycled by a certain time, um, which is pretty much an unachievable target. Um, but, and we think that probably if you did away with that target altogether and you had a measure that was actually um, this scheme has to be readily available to anybody who wants to dispose of an end-of-life device, that that would be one way then of, um, we call it the convenience model. That would be one way then maybe you could just include repair in there somehow as well. Mm. Um, and I guess the... The other point is about tracking devices. So, so we at ANZRP we already do include tracking devices in our in the e-waste, and we've actually stopped using a couple of recyclers because our products have ended up in interesting places. Um, but one of the issues that we do that would need to be dealt with is the um, uh, the legislation about I just what's it called tracking. Uh, you can't put a tracking device in something without telling somebody. I've uh, just forgotten the... Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, surveillance legislation, that's it, yeah. So we can do it because we've got um, contracts with our recyclers and contracts with our transport providers, and in those contracts we say we'll include tracking devices. Um, but that's probably, probably enough from <coughs> me, and I'll hand back to John, I guess. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, Janet. Thanks for the thanks for the overview and mm. for, I suppose, exposing uh, some information about programs and services and initiatives mm. that parts of the market, mm -hmm. some consumers might know about. Uh, so very useful information. If we can move on to you now, Ian, uh, from the Consumer Electronics uh, Suppliers Association, to give us a snapshot of of your industry, your membership, and uh, some insights, some views, your position on the uh, Productivity Commission draft report as well. So over to you, Anne. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, 
I'm just going to get a, a, a brief overview of what uh, Caesar's position is on, on this issue and, and make some comments on the, uh, uh, some of the uh, recommendations by the P Productivity Commission. Um, as John mentioned earlier, earlier Caesar is the premier national industry body uh, representing the consumer electronics industry generally. Um, our members are well placed to comment on possible policy options to address perceived barriers to repair as they are prominently predominantly global suppliers, so our membership are the, the Samsungs and LGs and Energizers and Melees, Electroluxes of this world, all the brands that you're familiar with. Um, our members are well acquainted with the EU Eco Design Directive. Uh, in fact, Australia is rather following what's happening in many other jurisdictions around the world. So we're very close, we work closely with our sister organisations in Europe, APLIA, and, and uh, AHAM in the United States, um, where they're currently involved in the 20, 27 states that have legisl legislative proposals for these on these issues. So we're, we're close to what's happening uh, worldwide. Um, our members have well-established repair facilities, uh, both in-house and third-party authorised repair networks. So over the many decades, they've undertaken uh, the vast majority of consumer electronics repair particularly in, in the warranty space. Um, Caesar strongly believes the scope of future RTR proposals, uh, if justified and demonstrating a net benefit to the community, so you have to get over the, the hoops of regulatory impact statements and so on, once they're justified, we believe these proposals should be confined to major household appliances in the consumer electronics sector and focus on professional repairers, such as in the eco um, design directive. Uh, the professional preparer, repairer does not necessarily have to be one directly employed or contracted by the supplier. To Caesar, this could be an independent body as long as the repairers are able to demonstrate they comply with applicable regulations and standards, that they are covered by relevant insurance, covering liabilities resulting from the offered service, uh, particularly in the electrical safety and cyber security space. Um, in the Australian context, we believe it is important that such services should be nationwide and take account of Australia's unique consumer laws, um, electrical safety standards and regulatory arrangements under the Product Stewardship Act or Product Stewardship Schemes. Uh, we strongly believe that a substantial data analysis mapping of the repair sector is required in order to make evidence-based proposals for future policy or regulatory options. Um, we consider right to repair proposals should focus upon products and repair markets where there is evidence of low durability of products, lack of repair facilities and insufficient nationwide um, coverage. I'll just tackle a couple of the issues we put to the submission in our, uh, the commission in uh, our submission, with things we highlighted. Um, we believe the Stone Consumer Law provides very strong, access, uh, very strong protection for consumers in Australia, uh, far greater than many other jurisdictions. Consumers have incredible protections under the ACL. In addition, the du durability of consumer electronics has vastly improved over time. Um, yes, are they going to be there? Where am I to? Only when the case for lack of repair and service data sharing has been clearly proven. This is where I, I think the, a lot more analysis needs to be done. Once it's clearly proven, only then should any mandatory obligations be considered. Um, in the consumer electronics sector, it has become increasingly difficult uh, to identify and locate suitable, qualified professional repairers, particularly in the rural and regional areas. Um, this is due to lack of training, uh, an ageing workforce, these are real issues for our companies because they can't get enough people to do their own warranty uh, repairs, uh, let alone post-warranty. Um, we believe uh, available ev evidence does not point to a systematic competition problem, we believe, in the consumer electronics area, industry, uh, that part four of the Act uh, is, is suitable to address any anti-competitive repair activities. We don't think there's any necessity there for proposals. Um, 
and we do not consider current intellectual property protections pose a barrier to consumer electronics repair in Australia. That's our position. You may not agree with that, but that's our position and we'd like to see evidence where um, it has done that. Uh, just a couple of uh, points on the findings of the Commission, the, the report recommendations. CESAR strongly endorses the Commission's recommendations for further analysis to determine whether barriers to repair are generating harm in any given sector, and that in-depth case-by-case case analysis in both the repair market and the primary market for all products is required prior to implementing uh, positive obligations. Uh, it's very important for CESAR members that the Commission distinguish between product markets. Consumer electronics sector is very different to the agricultural machinery sector. It's very different to the motor vehicle sector or therapeutic goods. Um, you know, for example, we don't have tens of thousands of repairers out there such as the, 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 the AAA uh, people have. Um, we have different uh, requirements for installations, uh, heating and cooling systems, air conditioning, gas, where the, has to, the installers are involved. Very, di very different uh, um, issues there. Um, we agree that, uh, with the Commission's uh, rec uh, findings that the repair activity is, is diminishing in the electronic sector as replacement tends to be more attractive due to falling prices, rapidly falling prices, durability and consumer preferences for up-to-date services. Um, CESA does not support and has some reservations with the Commission's recommendations regarding changes to the NTCRS scheme um, to facilitate repair and reuse. We believe there are adequate and comprehensive policies and regulations already in place to address the e-waste issue and that perhaps should be left to the Environment Department to, to work on. Our position is that the NTCRS scheme, as, as Janet just said, is a scheme for recycling. It's a, of only a segment of the e-waste area. It's only two lines, computers and um, televisions. Uh, there's a vast amount of other e-waste generated out there that have not been included in the NTCR scheme. Despite industry, we have been lobbying for years and years for the government to pick up the, the WE directive in Europe and add many other e-waste streams the NTCR scheme, but it has fallen on deaf ears uh, to date. Um, the NTCR scheme was not, uh, was not designed uh, for um, reuse and refurbishment. It, it, it's an it's a end of life issue, not a prolonged uh, life uh, uh, scheme. Um, we do question how co regulatory bodies, as suggested in the report, uh, could undertake repairs who would fund the repairs, who would own the repaired products, and who would take uh, responsibility for the repaired product, particularly in regard to electrical safety and data security once it was repaired. Um, an issue brought up by the, AA, uh, the AAA people this morning um, was it's a good idea when uh, on the lobbying side for people in the industry trying to build the repair industry uh, not to muddy the waters by uh, focusing on more than one portfolio. I agree with their suggestion that they, they should stick to uh, Treasury and ACCC, those sorts of issues, rather than muddying the waters with Department of Environment and Productivity uh, Product Stewardship uh, Schemes. Uh, that's about all I have mm -hmm. to say. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Thank you kindly for that. Thanks for your, your frank and, and candid uh, views and position on these issues. Many of the issues you raise, the questions uh, that you pose, uh, are really being in part addressed by the review of the Product Stewardship Act, where there are several recommendations looking to deal with uh, the role of repair, uh, reuse, durability uh, and recyclability uh, in relation to electrical and electronic products, and, and also the, the proposed uh, or the draft report from the Productivity Commission. I think your point around... Uh, the need to uh, uh, look more specifically at product class by product class uh, in many respects is really important. Uh, it's not a one size fits all when it comes down to very specific and practical measures 
to uh, look at the issue of repair and improving the rate of repair where appropriate. So we do need to, in my view, look at product class by product class and what does that mean and, and what, are the, what are the opportunities. I think one of the challenges here for all of us is how we do work together uh, in a constructive way, how we do collaborate, how we do reflect the wishes of the market, uh, understand the constraints of uh, the producers and all of the other stakeholders that are, that are involved. But I think in part, it is about how we flip uh, those things which we see as roadblocks, as barriers to repair. Can these be transformed into opportunities, new industries, uh, where there are issues that are simply too uh, problematic or there is no net benefit uh, environmentally, economically, socially, then we need to decide accordingly. So there is a need to, in some respects, as I say, within a stewardship context, look at a very practical expression of what a circular economy means for product stewardship programs. And, and that requires collaboration, not combat. Um, our next speaker, uh, Spiro Kalos. If I can pass on to you, Spiro, to uh, uh, share your views and position and uh, uh, insights in relation to repair. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all, and thank you, John, and to the organisers of this event and for the opportunity to be a part of uh, today's discussions. So the Australian Mobile Telecommunications Association, or better known as AMTA, is an industry association, uh, and our members include the network providers, network infrastructure companies, uh, and also the handset manufacturers. Now, my role within AMTA is to, to head up Mobile Muster, which is a, an industry-led uh, product stewardship scheme voluntarily funded by its members, uh, which again include handset manufacturers. And what makes us quite unique is the network carriers. So Vodafone, Telstra uh, and Optus are, are all funding members of the program. We've been operating for over 23 years uh, and formally credited, uh, accredited in 2014 under what was the Product Stewardship Act of 2011. Now, in that time, we've collected and recycled over 1,600 tonnes of product, uh, including handsets, batteries and accessories, effectively diverting this product from ending up in the general waste stream. The product scope for us has expanded since the program established itself in 1998, um, and at that time, it was to tackle the issue that was uh, mobile phone batteries. From a repair perspective, we want and encourage people to think about reusing or repairing their mobiles. That is, as it, as it is an important step in extending the life cycle of these devices. Um, and as we know, repair is a complex issue and it does vary from product to product, uh, and especially when acknowledging that there are already established repair frameworks for, for some of these product streams. So our research indicates that one in three consumers have actually repaired a mobile phone, and with 60% of those individuals utilising the services of an independent, uh, independent repair store, uh, but I only expect these numbers are actually going to continue to grow. Um, what I might just add here is earlier we heard from the Commissioner make the comments that the electronics repair industry has been shrinking. Um, in our space, it's a growth channel for us in terms of volume of product being collected year on year. Uh, and we've seen growth coming from the independent repair work, uh, year on year growth over the last four years. Um, and we also have over 300 independent repair stores that are currently participating in the program. There's a couple of areas within the draft report that um, I'd like to make some specific comments on. Um, the first one being around software updates for a reasonable period of time. Um, and something that uh, is already happening within the mobile phone industry with most brands supporting updates uh, for a minimum of two years. But what we are seeing is that updates are being used as a competitive advantage um, against, uh, against the brands themselves. So, uh, just a couple of examples, Nokia recently announced a campaign called Love It, Trust It, Keep It, uh, and they're encouraging their customers to hold on to their devices for longer um, and supporting them with software and security updates uh, of three years. Samsung only recently, in fact, last week, announced security updates of up to five years across their devices. But ultimately, the flow and effect here is that consumers hold on to the devices for a longer period of time. And so the average ownership now is sitting uh, at over 2.7 years. Um, secondly, um, I just want to touch on the role of product stewardship, and I guess that's where my experience lies. So historically in this country, product stewardship has been about collecting and recycling product. Um, now, I'm a supporter of Mobile Muster becoming more than that and actively encouraging consumers to play their part within, within the circular economy. 
What we do know is that there is a significant volume of product that's being stored at home um, with, act, with um, one in three consumers telling us that data security and management is actually stopping them from recycling. And I don't think that's exclusive to mobile phones. So um, we're currently working on a project to expand the product type collected by Mobile Muster. And our research uh, indicates that Australians are actually holding onto multiple product streams in their homes. So at, um, so at Mobile Muster, we're taking steps to change consumers' attitudes and behaviours by developing tools and resources to help educate them on how they can manage that data so that they can reuse mobiles by selling them or passing them on, uh, or if they've reached the end of their useful life, then to recycle them through, uh, through Mobile Muster. So from my perspective, I see the role of product stewardship as an educational one, um, helping us to tackle the barriers when it comes to reuse and repair. Um, the data issue isn't going to go away. If anything, with more products being connected to the internet, there will be increased concern and interest in ban better managing our data. Um, so my view is product stew stewardship should complement a he healthy commercial market. Um, what we know is that regardless of reuse, repair or recycling, consumers want to know that there are measures in place to ensure their data remains secure and private. So setting repair targets for schemes like the NTCRS could simply amplify the data issue, increasing products being stored across the board. And the missed opportunity here is, is extending the life of these products through, re through, through reuse and repair, but also the missed opportunity to recover the resources that go into making these products. Um, so as we know, for the circular economy to succeed, we actually need consumers to, uh, to participate. Thank you, John. Thank you, Scott. Really good overview of where you're at in your industry with your particular product class around smartphones and, and related accessories. If I can just ask one question of each of you before we go to any other questions um, from the floor or through Slido, but um, trying to focus on, uh, on, you know, ever focus on solutions and, and practical measures for consumers. For each of you, this question, what do you think of the recommendation to explore further the idea of a consumer facing uh, rating of some sort, not dissimilar to what's happened in France, but the idea of some sort of star rating along the lines of energy efficiency star ratings, water efficiency, the Wells program for major appliances, etc. cetera. Um, so from each of you, a, a quick response on what you think of that recommendation to look at a star rating for consumers that relates to repairability, durability, starting with you, uh, Janet. Um, we're generally supportive, um, but I guess the one thing that we would ask is um, please harmonise with the French regulations and make sure that it's based on international standards that can be um, uh, easily compared. Um, I think, you know, a lot of our members already score quite well on the fix-it ratings um, that they've got on their website. And so we're, we're generally supportive. Mm. But we please, not another Australian label. Yes. Mm, mm, <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, good point. Ian? Uh, absolutely agree with mm. Janet. No more labels, right? Mm. It's particularly Australian, uh, purely Australian. Um, Keep in step with international jurisdictions. Don't, nothing special for Australia. Don't, mm. don't get out of step, particularly with the French uh, arrangements. Um, we've had a lot of experience with uh, the star rating systems for energy efficiency and water efficiency. Uh, they work very well. They're very successful. Um, consumers uh, at the point of sale uh, look at those. I think they're number two to price in terms of selection of products. So it's, uh, it's, it's very successful programs. Um, you, you could do a lot worse than, than emulate some of those elements in those programs. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, John, from, and I think, um, and to Ian's point, and I, I agree, I think the, there's examples out there where these ratings actually do work well and they do benefit um, consumers. Um, and they're actually quite measurable. And I think um, introducing any new uh, labelling or rating um, shouldn't be subjective. Um, so from my perspective, they should actually be measurable and take some learnings from either what we're seeing in France or, or the uh, energy rating um, label system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I, I've forever got an endless list of questions, but I'm just wondering if there are any questions from the floor 
there, Leanne, or from uh, through Slido from from participants. Thanks, John. Um, there are some questions that have come through. I'll I'll get Anna to um, ask some of the questions, and then we can hand back to you if that's all right. Um, we cool. we do have we have been receiving a number of comments um, through Slido and. Because they're not questions, we're not asking those. Um, we're not repeating those, if that's okay, just for the Good. audience. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> A genuine question yes. is welcome. <laughs> this one's from Kirsty Young. Could there be the notion of recycling drop-off points at the place of purchase for items which are beyond repair, i.e. JB Hi-Fi, Ted's cameras, etc.? Um, I guess I... Yeah. Um, well, yes, they, I mean, this is already happening, particularly yes. in the battery stewardship space mm. where, where the uh, retailers are, are collecting. Um, the larger items, I'm not sure mm. about large screen TVs and things, but um, well, there the is opportunities there. Yeah, under the NTCRS, a lot of the retailers are involved in the scheme mm. and you can bring your smaller electronics back to the shop for recycling. Mm. For the larger ones, it's problematic from a safety point of view. Yeah. Um, and they're usually dropped off at... Um, Council, council depots and mm. things. Yep. But re retailers are really uh, very um, active in this space. Mm. Uh, they're very, very keen to participate. Yeah. Okay, so this one's from Connie um, towards Janet. The IT department in a company wishes to purchase a product of better stewardship like Canon. However, finance disagrees. How can we solve this? That's <laughs> good. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, I guess you have to encourage um, your own sustainability standards, don't you? Mm. Really? You know, and um, this, is a, this is something, a complaint that we often have against government, for example. They say, you know, you should be recycling your um, products. And we say, would you like to buy a refurb? Oh, gosh, no. You know, so, um, so I think you have to encourage recycling standards internally, not recycling, sorry, sustainability standards, um, and make sure that they've got meaningful ratings in your procurement system. That's the only way that I can think to address that. Thank mm. you. Look, this I, one I think that's a yeah. really important question. The issue of uh, procurement mm. uh, holds great potential in terms of improving how procurement takes place, uh, positive procurement, sustainable procurement, circular procurement. Yep. So sometimes it is about uh, making sure, as Janet says, that there is uh, improved information retraining of procurement professionals uh, in line often with organisations' environment sustainability policies. You hear too often that an organisation will have a position on positive procurement and somehow it hits a major roadblock with uh, the procurement department who don't look at the range of factors that need to be assessed no. in purchasing products and services. So well, a great question and well answered, yeah. Jenna. Well, I mean, and for the, to the procurement department's defence, they've usually been given a KPI to reduce costs. Yes. You know, so. Sorry. And this question is from Ken. Many skilled repair techs begin with self-repair. If manufacturers place such onerous barriers on accessibility, how will they overcome the skill shortage? Sorry, could you just repeat mm. that yeah. Yeah. Um, slowly? And yes, of course. <laughs> Many skilled repair techs begin with self-repair. If manufacturers place such onerous barriers on accessibility, how will they overcome the skill shortage? Well, I'm in neither industry, but I, can, yeah, <laughs> I, I might just have a go. I think um, this is a very issue that probably Tim spoke about, yeah. and um, we have seen other um, people speak about, about the availability of information and repair manuals, and certainly this is Carl Wine's um, whole business model of providing information um, where they reverse engineer products oh. um, and make that information available. Mm -hmm. um, there is a really strong growing interest in... Um, in um, repair and in terms of looking at it through a STEM kind of industry, like the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, skills training that we need to be able to repair these really highly sophisticated um, objects. 
And there are those issues that we recognise, whether they're um, legal barriers or physical barriers or technological barriers, but there, there is certainly a, a growing willingness among society become, to become more trained and, and more skilled with um, technologies, I think, as we become more technological as well. Um, and that's certainly not to say that manufacturers are, um, as we say, taking steps positively to hinder um, repair or that education and training that needs to take place. Um, there's lots of really good examples within, um, as we say, training schools and skills, um, skill schools where there's actually industry working in partnership with training programs to help develop those skills. Well, some of our members have found it's increasingly difficult to get skilled people in, in, in some of our sectors. Yes. Uh, particularly when you get you know, far flung out in the West, mm. something like that. I mean, it's, it's almost the case where some of our members will not supply products to places like Broken Hill or Mount Isa because really? they know there's no service of capability in that area. And particularly for products where uh, you need the person to come to the home, such as washing machines or a fridge or air con, air con um, there's no service capability out in that area. Um, mm. They've, they've made a decision not to supply that area. Mm -hmm. mm. And I guess if you come at it from another way, the, um, the recommendation in the Productivity Commission report to exempt a manufacturer from liability if um, a, repair, a repairer has um, done something to damage the product, I think that's an important one. But on the other hand, it's also something that's really hard to prove often. So it's a bit of a can of worms. Mm. I think in, in, in tort mm. law, when we, we talk about it, we talk about a, a, a break in the chain of causation. Right. And, and that's very much looking back at what's the causation of the loss yes. and where is the damage caused. Yeah. And if there's a yeah. break in the chain of causation, mm. um, then the original um, party won't be liable. Right. So I think there are um, legal principles in, in place to recognise where the manufacturer won't be liable anymore mm -hmm. if there has been um, a significant repair done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's that whole issue of um, is there quality skill in yes. the repair service? Yes. Um, and I think that's a recognised legal principle. Mm -hmm. Good. Do we have any other questions from yes, the floor? Yes, we do. Um, so this one is from Erin. Can Janet and Ian please give details on how their industry's products are getting more durable? This goes against what I've seen and experienced. Um, well, I'll give you an example. Washing machines, for example, uh, this, is, this is data from Europe that they put to the, uh, uh, the EU when they're looking at uh, the new directive, that washing machines are now, um, they were, in terms of failure over their lifetime, it was about 9% uh, 10 years ago, now it's 4%. So they're, they're, you know, they're, they're lasting longer. A lot of these products are lasting longer, far longer than uh, when it comes to the consumer's um, um, preference to replace a product for you know, just getting the latest technology or for fashion reasons. Um, they, they just are more durable. Mm. Yes, I haven't got... I haven't got actual sort of hard evidence that I can say, but I, I know within within Canon, certainly the amount of work that goes through our camera workshop has decreased a lot mm. because the products are very reliable. And it's the same for the um, multifunction devices or photocopiers that we sell. Um, we uh, repair them less often. We can repair them remotely. Um, and Peep and they've got their life cycle is extending, I think, from like five years to seven years, something like that. I, I haven't got the data exactly, but I'm sure we could provide some. Mm. Mm. But definitely warranty repairs have diminished over mm. time. Mm. Mm. Um, Chris? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Chris says here that he agrees of Ian's position um, within the agricultural service repair industry. There is currently also limited um, suitability qualified professional mechan mechanics available. So he agrees with you there. Mm -hmm. um, and then this one has three likes from Keela. Um, Isn't it wise to have meaningful tracked deposits slash refunds to make sure industry pays for their product at end of life? for skilled slash unskilled relocalised services? 
Um, so well, are, are we talking about re repair or are we talking about recycling? Um, she seems to be asking about industry paying for the products at end of life for... Okay. Well, no, I think well, we recycling. Yeah. Well, we are. Right. Like, yes. mm. like, like the NTCRS scheme, mm. uh, all the suppliers uh, pay a levy, uh, have a liability on their imports to cover the end of life of the product, to cover the, the cost of the scheme. So uh, I might add that that is passed on to consumers mm. at the point of sale. Mm. The same as batteries. Uh, come uh, this Christmas, the battery stewardship scheme comes into play and uh, our members, Energizer and Duracell, will pay four cents on every battery they import into Australia to cover the cost of that recycling scheme, which again will be passed on to the consumer. Um, it's an ACCC authorised scheme uh, where they've allowed that to be completely passed to the consumer. So it's like a, you know, they, mm. they pay, but in the end the consumer pays. John, um, perhaps you said you had some questions. We've got a, a couple more minutes before we close this session. Well, John, if we accept the, uh, the assumption that there is scope for all of us to always improve, if we accept that for a moment, and if a, a question for uh, Ian and for Janet and for Spiro, if there's, if there's an area or an opportunity to improve what uh, your various industries are doing or adjust them or uh, in terms of repair and product stewardship, what might be one or two things that you could do, whether it's consumer education, whether it's greater promotion of existing programs, what, what might be an area where there is scope for genuine improvement uh, from each of you, a snapshot there? Well, perhaps uh, we're talking about the labelling scheme of uh, durability. Uh, that could be something. Uh, um, awareness, education, another thing. Um, just one thing I did want to say is that something important to our members is consistency uh, in policy. Um, we have in, in the uh, PC re report, uh, they made reference to some ACCC amendments whereby they changed the definition of what a major fa failure is in a, in a product. Uh, this is to do with the consumer guarantee. What those amendments done uh, do, um, and they are inconsequential amendments passed in December last year, they are going to encourage consumers to go to the refund and replacement option rather than the repair option. Because minor failures, uh, you have the option of repair under the consumer guarantee. It becomes a ma major failure, you have op options for replacement and refund. Uh, so this, this action by the ACCC is going to encourage, I know it was designed to get consumers out of the endless uh, repair cycle, you know, you know, more than one repair, you know, multi-repairs. Uh, that, that's what the amendments were designed for. But what it in fact does is going to encourage people to move away from repair and into refund and replacement, further adding to the e-waste mountain. Just a statement. Uh, the golden rule, the golden <laughs> rule, Ian, of uh, perverse, perverse consequences of poor policies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Spiro. Thank you, John. Um, I think there's, there's a couple of things here from my perspective. The first one being, and I did touch on it a little bit earlier, is around the expansion of uh, Mobile Muster. Um, so there is a project that we're actually working on at the moment to expand into product that's actually currently not being picked up by an existing scheme um, and very much product that's actually in line with our industry. So uh, we're looking at modems, digital set-top boxes um, and if, if, um, technology that is at the start of its life cycle. So if we think of wearables and smart home tech. The other piece for me um, and and you know, I've sort of been a big advocate for product stewardship in playing an active role in educating consumers. And we've been doing that quite successfully in and around reuse and we've developed campaigns and we've got how-to videos and tips on our website um, to get consumers thinking about reuse so they're not stockpiling um, these products. And in fact, we've got 24 and a half million phones being stockpiled around the country. Four and a half million of those are actually broken. And I think something that came out of the um, commissioner's draft report is that consumers aren't across or aware of their rights within the ACL. So 
This year, we're looking at um, developing some campaigns around educating consumers on repair, so how to go about getting their devices repaired and what options actually exist for them. Uh, the, uh, anything further from, from, uh, from you, Janet, or Ian, um, or uh, Spiro, on any of that? I think, um, you know, we touched before on the need to expand the scope of the NTCRS. Uh, to, to cover anything with a plug, basically. Um, mm. So we want economies of scale and not separate schemes, not one for batteries and one for TVs and one for packaging and, and cartridges. If we can have, you know, a national scheme that then has scale so that you can funnel, funnel everything into it and then you can funnel the stuff that's repairable off, I guess, before it gets to be recycled. I think that's one thing. The other thing is that we need to do a lot of work to re um, encourage reuse and also products made of recycled material. Um, so whatever sort of incentives we can put in place to encourage that, I think, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Beth. Look, if I can maybe finish just with a couple mm. of comments. First one is thank you so much to um, our industry representatives uh, joining us today. Not a straightforward uh, forum, uh, given the nature of the discussion and the debate, um, but very useful to hear from, from Janet, from Ian, from Spiro about what's happening, where they sit on these issues. And what all of this tells me is that submissions as part of this next stage, commenting on the draft report from all of us is really, really important and as is the need to um, establish really constructive dialogue mm. and, and put ourselves in the shoes of, of each other in terms of these issues and how we work collaboratively in, in, in a way that is constructive, not cliche. Um, these are complex issues in some respects and therefore the more we communicate and co-design the solutions, the better. So uh, thanks again to Ian and to uh, Spiro and to uh, Janet and to the very, uh, pertinent questions. Uh, I'd love to see some of the statements, I must say, uh, but the, uh, the question's really good. The response is great. And I would also urge the commissioners to not uh, uh, to be not too selective about what constitutes evidence and what doesn't. We mustn't overlook subjective input. Uh, not everything is quantitative. This is an issue in part of consumer attitude and consumer empowerment. And so not everything is cut and dry in terms of where evidence is. So we do need to look laterally at uh, the evidence that might be there across a range of issues and not discount them. And one area where I'd encourage the Commission uh, and submitters uh, and indeed uh, myself to, to contribute is the role of design is very important. Mm. Uh, many of these decisions are significantly impacted at the design stage. How do we use design to address these issues? How do we acknowledge and celebrate where design is currently being used to deliver uh, repairability, durability, reliability, and so on? So I'll stop at that point, but thank uh, thank our panelists, thank you, Leanne, and thanks to all the participants and the great questions. Uh, from my end here in regional Victoria on some technology that made it possible to participate and contribute. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very thanks, much, John. John. Thank you, John. And, and thank you, Ian. Thank, thank you, Leanne. And, and yeah. thank you, Spiro. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll close this session. Um, thank you. Thanks.